All right, are we live? Are we on? I, I'm actually on the website trying to find it. Let me look and see. Let me look and see. I bet we are. But let me just validate and verify. YouTube subscriptions. Yeah. Okay, we're up. All right, well, good evening. Looks like we're, we've got everything going tonight. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Uh, once again, um, as you have made us a kingdom and priests, uh, priests who serve you, uh, serve you with that special privilege of receiving uh, your presence through your word, enjoying your presence through prayer, uh, and taking that presence with us as the bouquet of life uh, to those who are receiving Christ and the bouquet of death to those who are not. Into every um, interaction that we have in this world. We do pray this evening um, as we come to the end of the day that uh, this study and um, what we are looking at this evening might uh, become part of that incense that is offered to you in the evening sacrifice and that it would waft up into your presence and that it would bring you much joy and it would bring you much glory and that it would indeed form and shape us more to be devoted to you as followers of our King Jesus Christ within this world. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, good evening. I believe we have everything working tonight things are i feel like a little askew here uh, but we're going to make it work at this point um, we are looking at our supplemental study here in first peter exiles embracing and embodying hope in a hostile world now we began a few weeks ago to look at this theme of temple as we find it in 1 Peter chapter 2, because it's really important for us uh, to get a sense of the, um, the historical or the redemptive historical meaning and significance and the ministry of the temple in the Old Testament for us to really grasp what Peter is trying to communicate to us here. And um, a lot of us have not spent a lot of time studying the Old Testament, uh, specifically with regards to the tabernacle or the temple. A lot of us haven't done um, an in-depth look at the sacrificial system, the priesthood, uh, the architecture. What did the clothes look like that the priests wore? What were the colors? Were the colors important? If they were, why? You know, what did the interior of the tabernacle look like? What did the interior of the temple look like? Um, how did these things connect to the furniture that was in the holy place, the furniture in the holy of holies, as well as the stuff that was out in the courtyard? Um, how many courtyards were there? I mean, there's all kinds of details that the Lord has been very specific in communicating to us. And so this evening, let's begin once again by looking uh, at just a couple of verses here from 1 Peter 2. As you come to Jesus Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I introduced this a couple weeks ago, um, and we looked at a couple of videos. We're going to re re review uh, some of that. Um, but I really introduced this several weeks ago in the sermons, um, where we began looking at this redemptive historical reality and importance of temple uh, or tabernacle, both of those basically being interchangeable, uh, other than the fact that tabernacle was mobile, temple was fixed. But both of them were a spiritual house of God where God was making his presence known. And this idea of temple runs 
from the very beginning of Scripture, uh, going all the way back to Genesis chapters uh, 1 and 2, uh, and it runs all the way through, or chapters 1, 2, and 3, and it runs all the way to the end of the Bible, where Revelation 21 and 22, as it is bringing things to a close, it is very purposefully describing the new heavens and the new earth in terms of temple, uh, both in terms of the cube structure of the city, the fact that it specifically mentions that there is no temple there because God dwelling with his people is the temple, uh, and Revelation 22, bringing that garden imagery uh, from Genesis and that garden temple reality um, that God began with, God ends the scripture with. So this is an extremely important concept that the Lord is using to help uh, us understand his purposes, understand his plans, understand exactly what it is that he is doing with us as his people. Now, the writer of Hebrews is very helpful to us in this. Oh, that's right. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 9 gives us some really important information to help us understand what God is doing with all of this. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood that is not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he, appe he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Oh, I knew that didn't sound right. We got that out of order. Ha. Let's read the look of the first five verses of Hebrews. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship. And by first covenant here, if you remember from some of the earlier lessons here, first covenant, old covenant, these are referring to uh, what we call the Mosaic covenant. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when we look at all this, especially if we had uh, looked at it in order, <laughs> uh, what we would have noted here is that when uh, the Lord institutes the Israelite covenant or the Mosaic covenant, um, he doesn't just provide a means of grace uh, through the sacrificial system. He provides everything. He provides the means of grace in terms of the sacrificial system, but he also includes providing the provisions of a priesthood uh, and providing that, that ultimate provision of an actual holy space. Uh, in which these things were to take place as he himself was taking up residence with his people. The writer of Hebrews goes on to tell us that everything that we see described of that first tabernacle and as that is replayed a second time in Solomon's temple, that all of what's going on there at the earthly level was to show us the, a copy of apparently what exists in the heavenly places, in the heavenly courts above. 
And just as, and this is so important, so vital, we can't really pursue it tonight, but it's so, it is so vital. When the priest, when they, uh, on the Day of Atonement, when the, when the blood was shed, the priest had to take that blood. And even though it had been shed, until that blood was actually poured out on the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that was all the way, the furthest way in, into the Holy of Holies, until that blood was applied to that mercy seat, uh, that sacrifice was not yet effectual for what it was supposed to accomplish. And what the writer of Hebrews tells us is this, in a similar way, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, he died as our substitutionary sacrifice, his blood was shed. Uh, he offered himself as our high priest, and yet it wasn't until he ascended back into the heavenly sanctuary and that blood was presented to his father uh, there in that, that heavenly sanctuary, that is where that, that work of Christ became um, um, effectual in accomplishing what it was purposed to do. So it was really important that he ascend and go back to the heavenly places and that um, what we see at the earthly level is a reflection of what is going on at the heavenly level. So when we look at what God has shown us at the uh, earthly level, uh, I want to start with, with Eden because I have mentioned this a couple times and several people have asked me, well, well how do we know that Eden was a garden temple where where do we see that it was described as a temple uh, why do we why have I referred to it as a as a mountain garden temple well when you look at Ezekiel 28 um, 28 13 14 and 16 and we could get uh, into the, the details but I just want to show that as Eden is described Eden is Called in Ezekiel, it is called a holy mountain. Uh, Sinai, when God uh, uh, land, you know, uh, descends onto the mountain and the Shekinah glory cloud envelops the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai is referred to as a holy mountain. When Moses interacts with God um, at, at the fire uh, there at the the the, um, the bush that caught on fire and yet wasn't being consumed, he was. Uh, there um, on what they were uh, what was called a holy mountain the idea of being in God's presence is often referred to as holy mountain and then obviously Mount Sinai uh, and the temple on Mount Sinai throughout the Old Testament is referred to as a holy mountain um, Eden in Ezekiel 28 is referred to as a holy mountain that same mountain temple language. Uh, this temple, however, does not have walls. What it consists of is a tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, and then what happens when Adam and Eve fall into sin, God in his mercy does not allow them to partake of the tree of life in a fallen state, and so they are cast out of Eden. And what we are told specifically is that they were cast out to the east. What do we see at the tabernacle? What do we see at, the temp at every temple, uh, whether it's Solomon's, Zerubbabel's, or Herod's? We all see that they have the same um, directional orientation and that all of them have an east gate where the way you come into the tabernacle or you come into the temple is supposed to be coming in from the east. What do we see in the Garden of Eden? Well, they are cast out to the east so that the only way that they would be able to come back in would be to come in through an east gate. We're also told that after they are cast out to the east, that the east gate of the Garden of Eden is now guarded by two cherubim. Well, what do we see um, on the veil that you find in the tabernacle? What, do you, what images do you see 
on the folding doors of Solomon's temple, you see cherubim that are there guarding that entrance. What do you see in the Holy of Holies, by the way, um, on top of the Ark of the Covenant? There are two cherubim. What do you see uh, in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple? There are these two massive cherubim. All of the imagery that you see in the tabernacle and the temple is found right here in the holy mountain garden temple of Eden. How do you get back into Eden through the east gate? Well, you have to get past a flaming sword. You have to basically, um, the only way back in is through shed blood. The only way back in is basically dying. Um, at the hands of this flaming sword. So you have all the same imagery that uh, we see running throughout the tabernacle and all the different versions of the temple. All of that's found in Eden. So when you look at you know, the preponderance of all of these different details uh, and given the fact that when you look at the tabernacle and when you specifically, when you look at Solomon's temple, how many times... Uh, Solomon's temple, for example, is decorated with things like palm trees, fruit, garden imagery. So the, the, the scripture is very much trying to help us understand um, this connection. Well, before we go there... Um, I thought I had included the verses. Let's look at Ezekiel really quick. All right, Ezekiel 28. Look at verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire. Now, there is no doubt that this is some pretty cryptic language. Uh, this is one of those um, cryptic, apocalyptic um, passages that is uh, trying to help us understand um, this, the, this warfare that has been going on all the way back to the very beginning of creation and Eden as it is described at the beginning of creation before there was sin Eden is described as the holy mountain of God so 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 very important for us um, let's look at a quick little video that gives us a pictorial presentation of the tabernacle as it is described to us uh, in the book of Exodus. Let's see here. <clears throat> Oh, that's good. 
Let's keep going now as they show us what's inside. YouTube, if you want to learn more about the tabernacle, of Moses. All right, so the outer court was very simple. You had an east gate, you've got one courtyard. You had a bronze altar, a bronze labor. The bronze altar is uh, where they would perform the sacrifices. The bronze laver was used for, uh, for the, the water that they used for, for the cleansing rituals. Then you had the actual tent. And if you notice, there were curtains on the outside, uh, and then at the top was uh, animal skins. Um, on the inside, the first thing that you would see is the holy place. The holy place had the lampstand, the table of showbread or the bread of presence and the altar of incense. Then you had the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies had the Ark of the Covenant. Um, if you remember, we noted there two cherubim on the curtain going into the Holy of Holies, two cherubim on the mercy seat or on the top cover of the Ark of the Covenant. Now that's pretty neat stuff, but what is the significance, for example, of this bronze altar. We'll look in Leviticus chapter 6. Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth of the altar, or on the altar, all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. Further, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. Further, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. And we know that one of the specific duties that the priest had was keeping this fire burning. Now, why? Is it because, well, if the fire went out, they didn't have a way of starting a new fire? If the fire went out, they didn't have a way of doing the sacrifice? No, we are told very specifically why this fire fire was not to go out. Leviticus chapter 9. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and he blessed them and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. So he is coming down off this little earth earthen ramp away from the bronze altar. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and when they came out they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Okay, so why is 
the fire of the bronze altar absolutely supposed to be kept burning? Well, because its origin came from the presence of God's glory, a physical, real world expression and embodiment of God's presence shot out of the tent of meeting and took up residence within the bronze altar. And one of the things that that helps us to, that reminds us of is how many times are we told that God, our God, is a consuming fire. And consuming there is so important because what is God doing if God's presence is physically manifest as that fire in the bronze altar, well, every time the sacrifice would be put on top of that altar, the picture here is that God is consuming that sacrifice. And that's why it is pleasurable to him. That's why there is a sweet aroma to him. He, in a sense, is having a picnic. He's enjoying some good barbecue. Uh, because the picture there is that his presence is consuming um, that sacrifice. So it's really important that we understand that what makes the bronze altar so vital and so important is that God's presence is there in that altar in the form of that fire. So huge, so incredibly huge. All right, look at Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, where are they? Anybody, uh, this is why I wish we were in person, because I could ask questions. We do have a couple people here. Do, do we know physically, geogra geographically, where this is taking place? Exodus 40? It's in the wilderness. It is at the bottom of Mount Sinai. And what has enveloped Mount Sinai? God's presence in the form of the Shekinah glory. Then the cloud that was covering the mountain, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Now, one of the things that that helps us to understand is that what is being described here was not only happening on this specific day when the tabernacle comes into its usage, but throughout all the journeys of Israel, even including that 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, there was the fire on the altar that was God's presence, and there was this glory presence that could be seen that was filling the tent, and that there was this presence that was seen on top of the tent. And when that, that visible manifestation of God's presence as in terms of that fire, when it would move, then they knew it was time to pack up the camp and follow God. And when that fire would stop moving, then they knew, okay, this is where we're going to set up the camp. And the, and the first thing they would do is set up the tabernacle there under that fiery manifestation of God's presence. So this is, this is fantastic that this idea of presence here in the tabernacle is something that could be seen. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of that. It could be seen. Israel was encamped around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was right in the middle. And all of the tents, whether you lived on the north, south, east, or west, all the tents were oriented so that the tent door would open up so that you would see the tabernacle. You would get up in the morning, 
you would open your tent door and you would see the fire manifestations of God's presence there, you know, a couple miles away from you as it hovered over the tabernacle. This was visual. They could see this. All right. Let's keep moving. All right. So that was, that was the tabernacle. So we have seen uh, the, the uh, garden temple, uh, garden mountain temple in Genesis. Uh, we've looked at the tabernacle. Let's look really quickly once again here at Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple stood in Jerusalem for almost 400 years. It was the crown jewel of Jerusalem and the center of worship to the Lord. Almost half of the Old Testament writings took place during the time when Solomon's temple was still standing. Understanding the significance of its location, history, and design can greatly add to one's reverence for one of the most holy places in the world. The city of Jerusalem is located in an area of three major valleys, the Hinnom, the Central or Tyropian, and the Kidron Valley. The mountain range between the Central and Kidron Valley is called Mount Moriah. The peak of the mountain is a large protruding flat rock, which is now located under the Dome of the Rock. According to Genesis 22:2, Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac in the region of Moriah, connecting the Temple Mount with this significant event. At the time of King David, the area of Jerusalem was controlled by the Jebusites, the city only occupying the southern part of the Central Ridge. When David captured the city in about 1000 BC, he made Jerusalem his capital. David then moved the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and began preparations for building a permanent structure to replace the portable tabernacle of Moses that had been used for over 400 years. With the ancient city of Jerusalem being fairly small, David purchased the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite so he could expand the size of the city. Being higher than the city of David, the hilltop would make a beautiful place to build the temple of the Lord. Under the reign of David's son, King Solomon, the temple construction began. After seven years of construction in about 960 BC, Solomon finished building the temple, most likely built over the same protruding rock of Mount Moriah. Solomon also built himself a new palace just south of the temple and expanded the walls of the city up towards the peak of Mount Moriah. The Temple of Solomon was modeled after the Tabernacle of Moses. Because of the many similarities between the Tabernacle and the Garden of Eden, many scholars believe that the Garden of Eden was the prototype for the Tabernacle, and thus later temples. According to Jewish tradition, Eden was located on a hill, with the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil at the center of the hill. The Bible teaches that when Adam and Eve transgressed and partook of the forbidden fruit, they were cast out towards the east. Cherubim and a flaming sword were then placed at the east entrance to prevent them from partaking of the Tree of Life, as they would then live forever in their sin. In order to return back into the presence of God, Israel had to symbolically retrace the steps of Adam and Eve, passing the cherubim and re-entering the garden in a westward direction. The tabernacle was set up in the same east-to-west progression, seeming to replicate the Garden of Eden. The tabernacle was divided into three main courts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The outer court represented the fallen world, while the inner courts represented a more sacred and holier way of life. In essence, as the priest, who represented all of Israel, progressed through the tabernacle, or temple, he left the world to enter a more holy state, and then was enabled to re-enter the presence of the Lord, passing the angels, or cherubim, who were embroidered on the veil. Solomon's temple replicated this same three-level progression, doubling the floor plan size of the tabernacle sanctuary for the temple structure. 
As one approached the Temple of Solomon, the first thing noticed was the brazen altar of sacrifice. The altar was 20 cubits long and wide and 10 cubits high, a cubit being the length from the elbow to the tip of the longest finger, or about one and a half feet. On the four corners of the altar were four horns, horns often representing power. This is where the sacrificial animals were burned, representing the future sacrifice of the Savior Jesus Christ. On the southeast side of the temple was the molten or brazen sea, which rested on the backs of twelve oxen, three pointing in each of the cardinal directions. In ancient times, oxen represented strength, and the number twelve often represented the twelve tribes of Israel. Water from the larger brazen sea was poured into ten bronze water basins on both sides of the temple, which could then be wheeled around the outer court for various washing and cleansing rituals by the priests. Around the south, west, and north sides of the temple were three floors of chambers or storage rooms. The inside wall of the chambers was stepped so as to create a ledge where the timbers of the floors could rest. The storage rooms were accessed by a door on the south side of the temple, with wooden ladders going up into each of the floors. At the front of the temple were two large bronze pillars that flanked the porch. The pillar on the left was named Boaz, and the pillar on the right was named Yaquim. The tops were decorated with lily flower petals and pomegranates. Pomegranates were a sign of prosperity and posterity because of their many seeds, and were also found on the bottom hem of the clothing of the high priest. The main temple doors were made of two large bifolding doors covered in gold with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. The Bible describes the door frame as being a fourth part of the wall, which most scholars believe means that the door had four stepped frames. The interior doorway of the Holy of Holies was similar, except having five frames instead of four. The priests who represented Israel were the only ones allowed into the inner temple. This means that Israel only could enter through being represented by the priests. Once you entered the main doors, you entered the holy place, a large room 40 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. The room was overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, possibly alluding to the beauty of the Garden of Eden. The room was lit by ten large menorahs, five on each side of the room, that were constantly burning, and narrow windows on each side of the top of the room. On the right side of the room was located the table of showbread, which had twelve large flat pita-like loaves. The priests ate and then replaced the showbread every Sabbath, similar to our weekly partaking of the communion or sacramental bread. Breaking bread and sharing a meal with someone in ancient times represented that you were at peace with them and was a sign of brotherhood, love, and forgiveness. Directly in front of the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. The altar was similar to the altar of sacrifice in that it had a square footprint and also had four horns, one on each of the corners. However, on the altar of sacrifice was burned the flesh of animals, while upon the altar of incense burned a sweet combination of incenses. The incense burning before the veil of the temple represented the prayers of the saints ascending to God before the veil, a reminder that before we can enter God's presence, our lives, prayers, and actions must become a sweet savor unto the Lord. Only the high priest was able to enter the Holy of Holies, and only on one day a year, the Day of Atonement. Before entering, the high priest passed through a beautifully embroidered veil woven from purple, red, blue, and white threads. The colors were the same as used in the ephod and breastplate of the clothing of the high priest, minus the gold thread. Embroidered on the veil were cherubim, who symbolically guarded the dwelling place of God. As the high priest passed through the veil, he had to pass these angels, who, like in the Garden of Eden, guarded the way back to the presence of the Lord. Upon entering the Holy of Holies, you would find that the room is in the shape of a perfect cube, being twenty cubits wide, long, and tall. The walls were likewise overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. 
two large cherubim flanked the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the center of the room, with their wings stretching from one side of the room to the other. This room is where the presence of the Lord would dwell, and represented the final goal and destiny of all Israel. Solomon's temple was not only a landmark for the city of Jerusalem, but more importantly, the dwelling place of the Lord. The layout represented Israel's progression back into God's presence and was designed to teach Israel that it was only through the infinite sacrifice of the sinless Messiah that they could once again enjoy the presence of the Lord. A sacrifice that would be performed on a cross only a short distance from this holy mountain. Basically, the, the the tabernacle, but it's bigger, it's grander, and it's permanent. It's not moving around. Um, and with the temple, once again, you had similar uh, visual phenomena like you had with uh, with the tabernacle. So, the bronze altar and the Shekinah glory from 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire, uh, come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement. With their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly, he is good, truly. His loving kindness is everlasting. So just like we saw with the tabernacle, God's presence in terms of the fire on the bronze altar and the Shekinah glory taking up residence in the Lord's house is a visible manifestation once again that the people of Israel could see and visually experience at the temple. The Ark of the Covenant and the Shekinah glory from 1 Kings 8. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up, and King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. Remember the picture of those two cherubim there. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark so that the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came up uh, out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant and Shekinah glory from 1 Samuel 4. And Eli's daughter-in-law, Eli was the chief priest, um, uh, the high priest at this time, 
um, and the Philistines, uh, because of Eli's two wicked sons, uh, the, the Philistines had come and they had uh, taken the Ark of the Covenant. And what we are told is that Eli's daughter-in-law, um, after Eli died, when he saw all that had happened, uh, his daughter-in-law, uh, who was pregnant at the time when she gave birth, she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Why? Because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Now, what we're seeing here is not only that there are these visible manifestations of God's presence and God's glory, especially with regards to the fire on the altar, uh, with regards uh, to um, the, the fire uh, or the, the, uh, the Shekinah glory uh, that was connected to the ark. So connected were these things is that when the ark was taken away, it was the visible glory was gone. With that visible glory that they could see there on the house of the Lord, when the ark was taken away, the glory was no longer seen. When the uh, ark was returned, then once again, the glory would be seen. So it's a really important connection there uh, in understanding the way God is connecting his presence and his glory, not simply to the outward display of all the gold and bronze and silver and precious metals and all of those things, the purple and blue uh, thread with white and with gold thread. Those things were definitely supposed to impress, and they were to the ancient Near East, they were to, to demonstrate the idea of royalty. But the presence itself was not being displayed by all the gold and silver and outward manifestations there of those things. The presence was manifested in the fire on the altar and that Shekinah glory that had taken up residence uh, in the house of the Lord. Let's look at a quick video that shows us in a little bit more detail the, the clothing of the priests. And um, like a video that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, what this is is uh, the person who's made the video is reading through Exodus 28 and just giving us a visual presentation of the text as it is there in Exodus 28. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitre and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same, according to the work thereof even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold, and thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And thou shalt make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the ends. Of wreathen work shalt thou make them 
and fasten the wreathen chains to the ouches. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod thou shalt make it, of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be, being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreathen chains thou shalt fasten in the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. And there shall be an hole in the top of it in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of an habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, Holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre. Upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make for them, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him.
Okay, so we're getting to the end of, of tonight. Um, I'm not going to try to push further, but there's a, one of the reasons I wanted to show that to you in more detail is, is for a couple of things. First of all, have you ever wondered when you're reading through Genesis 2 why there is so much detail about the Garden of Eden having um, being a place of gold and having all of these gemstones. Do you notice what the high priests um, with the, the that front piece, that breastplate, that it was full of coal and and those gemstones and there was gold in the thread that made up some of the different pieces of his clothing. There was the gold um, across the front of, of the mitre. Um, the, when you look at the tabernacle and when you looked at the temple, what did you find? You found gold, gold, gold. You found gemstones. You found pictures of flowers, palm trees. You found garden imagery connected to gold and gemstones. That is not by happenstance that there is this connection once again being drawn uh, even with the clothing that the high priest wore and that description that you find in the Garden of Eden. When you connect the idea that the two verbs that are used to describe the work of the priest to work and to serve, those are the same two Hebrew verbs that are used to describe um, Adam's calling in the garden to work and to serve the garden. So once again, we see these very specific connections in the description of the Garden of Eden with the idea of, of temple presence uh, and the priesthood of Adam. Another reason I wanted to point out some of these details is if you look into this, what you'll find is these colors that made up the high priest's clothing, uh, especially the, the, the breastplate where, the, where it was that fine um, woven together blue and purple and scarlet and gold thread, right? As that was uh, woven together in that very special way. Um, that same thing was done on the sash that was worn by the, the regular priests as well. If you notice, those are the same colors that you see inside the tabernacle and inside the temple. It's those same colors of purple, scarlet, white, blue, and gold. And uh, the, the same colors that you see on the curtains that are inside the tabernacle. And one of the things that we have come to understand about that is what you would see when you visually took in uh, a priest, especially in connection with his sash, or when you visually took in um, the high priest and when he was wearing his, uh, his entire high priestly uh, garments, what you were basically looking at was a miniature tabernacle walking around in front of you because all the same colors that were on the inside that you didn't get to see, you got to see on your priest. Now that's really interesting. As he, was go, as he would go in and he would represent you in that place that you could actually see in your high priest a lot of the things that you wanted to see on the inside of that holy place that you were not allowed to see because you were not allowed to go in there, but you saw them in your priest. And the other connection that we know there is not only then can you kind of see that the priest uh, in their clothing kind of represented a, a, a smaller version of the tabernacle or the temple, maybe a better way of saying that is that the priests themselves were basically part of the tabernacle. The priesthood itself and the priests as they wore their garments and went about their business uh, there in the courtyard uh, as well as inside the holy place that they were extensions of the tabernacle itself. 
Now, why is that, why is that important for us? Well, let's close with this this evening. What does it mean for Peter to tell us that we are a royal priesthood? Royal. The royalty of Yahweh being presented here in the colors of gold, purple, blue, scarlet, and white. What does it mean for the priesthood to have those colors in the garments that they are wearing so that they are an extension of the tabernacle and that people could see um, on the priesthood what they couldn't see on the inside here because they weren't allowed to go. Well, what does Peter mean when he tells us that we are a royal priesthood and that um, our lives are serve as a witness to the truths and realities that people can't see in the heavenly courts? Do you see the connection here? The idea of us being these royal priests who are serving God on earth as those who, who have um, the marks of the realities of the heavenly places, we, we are serving a similar purpose. People here on earth, they could look at their priest and see something there that they couldn't grasp any other way. And when people look at our lives, when they look at the way we live, when they look at the way we live with hope, when they look at the way that we are able, uh, as Peter was talking about in the text this morning, to live in submission and to honor leaders who may not be honorable in and of themselves. Why can we do that? Because we are connected to a greater leader. We are connected to a greater king. And we serve as ambassadors of that king. And one of the ways that we do that is that we embody the truth and the character of our king. Do we do it perfectly? No. Did the priest in their garments perfectly embody the realities that were going on inside the holy place and the holy of holies? No. They didn't do it perfectly. There was not a one-to-one -one ratio there. But could you look at the priest's garments and look at the, the priest's ministry and get some kind of clue that your faith could latch onto of, of the things that you can't see. Yes. And beloved, for us to be called as royal priests who have the purpose of functioning as, as priests of the heavenly courts, the heavenly places, functioning that way here on earth, we uh, not only present our lives as sacrifices to the Lord, not only do we offer up our prayers as incense rising uh, to the Lord himself, uh, but we serve as the embodiment of realities that can't be seen um, and yet by faith can be grasped when people will look to us, when they will listen and receive the truth uh, that we have for them, um, and entrust themselves to the king whom we represent, um, the king who is present within our lives, the king that they can hear when we speak on his behalf as ambassadors of peace and reconciliation. This is amazing for us to be called a royal priesthood. And so this coming week, let these images and these pictures and these explanations of these things, let them grab hold of your imagination this week so that your, uh, as you work through the significance of your priesthood, that you're not just sitting there trying to work out naked truths or not just trying to, to work out propositional ideas, but that you, through the, you know, the imagination of faith, can really grab hold of the visuals and the realities that come with that so that you can see yourself as one who has been robed with the righteous robes of our Savior Jesus Christ to go out into the world to be the embodiment of his presence and his truth. Now, Lord willing, next week, next Sunday night, we will finally get to... 
um, what happens after, this, after Solomon's temple. The reason I wanted to back up this evening and go into a little bit more detail uh, is one, I felt like I rushed over a couple of things and I, and I got some questions from some folks. So I wanted to show in more detail from scripture where I'm getting some of this. But also, there is, when we really understand the significance, oh, there, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. From the priesthood and his clothes, did you notice the, the, the Urim and the Thummim, those two rocks that he had in his breastplate, those rocks were another special presence of the Lord there at the temple and the tabernacle because the way that those worked was the high priest could ask the Lord and most people understand this to be yes or no questions and that the Lord would answer the Lord would speak to his people and reveal his will through the the the, the Urim and the Thummim through the ministry of the high priest God was communicating and revealing his truth and his will for his people and for the world. You and I, as we serve as, so one, that shows a, a one more special presence of the Lord, like just like the fire on the altar and the Shekinah glory uh, in, in, the, in the tabernacle and the temple. It also helps us understand our priesthood as those whom God is revealing himself to through his word where we, in receiving God's will for us and for the world, we communicate that uh, to those who will listen. So that's another connection there. But Lord willing, next week what we're going to do is now dig into the distinctions uh, that are so vital in understanding the difference between the tabernacle and Solomon's temple in contrast to Zerubbabel's temple uh, which is built when they return from the Babylonian exile, and then Herod's temple, uh, which is the temple that was in place uh, when Jesus was here on earth ministering, uh, when the apostles are described in their ministry in the book of Acts. And there are some huge differences there that will be really important for us to dig into to really start understanding, uh, one, this distinction that Peter continues to draw between us being citizens of the heavenly places and sojourners and exiles here on earth, understanding that earthly heavenly dichotomy, uh, but also in helping us to understand some of the bad ethics that developed within the people of God with regards to um, the, the, the bad view that Jews had of Gentiles and, and non-Jews the bad view that uh, Jewish men had of everyone else, including Jewish women, and the hierarchy that they developed uh, within their society that they allowed to be reflected in the structure of Herod's temple. Uh, and this is going to be really important for us as we dig into what, what Peter is going to talk to us about in terms of the way uh, husbands and wives relate to one another as co-heirs in Jesus Christ, as those who are equal together uh, because the righteousness that our wives receive by faith is exactly the same as the righteousness that the husbands receive by faith. It's a wonderful re uh, correction uh, that Peter is going to be making uh, to help us once again understand how to faithfully and practically live out what it means for us to be priests of the heavenly places ministering here on earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, these are amazing realities. Sometimes it's easy to refer to them simply as truths. And they are truth, and they are truth statements. They are not less than that, but they are so much greater than that. That you have not communicated to us ideas, but you have communicated to us eternal realities. And the ideas are there to help us embrace and embody those eternal realities. And so, Lord, free up the imagination of our faith this week 
to really ponder and reflect upon our King and Savior, our King and High Priest, Jesus Christ, so that we would continue to fall more and more in love with him, to appreciate more and more his ongoing ministry on our behalf, and for us to continue uh, to, by uh, fuel, fueled by your grace and your spirit, to continue to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ as we continue to put to death the sins and misdeeds of who we once were in Adam. Lord, indeed, we ask that you would use the witness of our royal priesthood this coming week to encourage somebody with Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, whether that be someone hearing the gospel uh, or a, a fellow believer receiving encouragement, Lord, help us to serve in the courtyard, in the cosmic courtyard of your, uh, your world as we represent the, the rule of Jesus Christ and we present his life and his grace. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you once again. Uh, we will continue, Lord willing, next week uh, and hopefully finally dig into some of these, uh, these details that I have just been really, really wanting to dig into. The Lord be with you this evening and this coming.